ground class. Thank you. Uh, does the mic work? Yeah, looks like it, it is. So hello, I'm, uh, I'm Andre, and uh, there's a lot of you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm going to talk about graphs and uh, kind of about a new approach to working with graphs in functional programming languages. Uh, so I call this approach algebraic. It's a very overloaded term, and I apologize for that, but I couldn't find a better term. Maybe we'll find one with you. So before I continue, I should also clear up some possible ambiguity. <laughs> so if you search for algebraic graphs in Google, this is what you get. So these are not the graphs I'm looking for in Google. I'm looking for this kind of graphs. So we have vertices and edges, uh, connections between vertices. And still, if you stick to that, there are also lots of different variations of graphs. So more specifically, I'm looking for labeled vertices, graphs with labeled vertices. And any, con any connectivity, so you're allowed to form cycles, you're allowed to form self loops. Um, I'm interested also in directed or undirected graphs. And I do not consider edge labels in this talk, in this paper. Uh, there are no vertex ports. So, for example, there was a, a very, very nice talk by Connell Elliott where he was converting, well, compiling into categories, and he had graphs with vertices that had ports. So I don't have ports. And I also don't have any sort of forbidden edges. Sometimes uh, you have graphs where you have sort of heterogeneously typed vertices, and not all vertices are compatible, so not, o not all vertices can be connected. So I don't consider this case. So any connectivity is allowed. Uh, and if you have any questions during the talk, don't hesitate to ask to clarify things. This is the usual way we uh, describe what, a what such a graph is mathematically. So just a pair of vertices and edges. And there is some side consistency condition that says that an edge ha must have both of its endpoints in the set of vertices. Otherwise, it's not a graph. And here's an example. So you have a graph with three vertices and two edges, uh, one, two, and one, three. There is a straightforward translation of this into Haskell. Not an exact translation, but here we have a product type with a list of vertices and a list of pairs of vertices or edges. And the example is almost exactly the same as in mathematics. But there, there is a problem here. Uh, can you spot the problem? Pardon? List, list is one potential problem, yeah. Another one? Exactly. So I didn't, I, I kind of forgot about this con consistency condition on, on top. I didn't express it in Haskell. So essentially, we can have a problematic case. So this is not a graph, according to the mathematical definition. We have this one, two edge, which refers to vertex two, which is not in the set of vertices. This is not a graph in mathematics, but our simple definition thinks it's a graph. So the, this program compiles, and somewhere later we will get a runtime error because we try to traverse this graph, because it's not a graph, right? So how do we deal with this? Uh, the problem is it's hard to express this in types, right? Uh, at least right now, maybe some future Haskell will be able to express such types. And I think there are two solutions to this. Uh, you can fix Haskell, right? So there's a lot of people are working on refinement types and dependent types, which will hopefully make it easy to express such side conditions. Uh, but the other approach which I'm taking in this paper and fixing the underlying math. So I'm trying to come up with new math that allows us to describe graphs without this inherent partiality in, in the description, which will allow us to work with sort of basic simple data types Haskell uh, 98 data types without any refinement or dependency type uh, tricks. So this is probably the slide which I want you to remember. This data type is what I'm going to use to represent graphs. It's very much tree-like. So we have leaves that are vertices. We have internal nodes that are of two types, either labeled with overlay operation or with connect operation. And there are also kind of empty subgraphs or empty leaves, which don't have any sort of vertex in them. So it turns out that you can use this uh, sort of uh, expression language to express every possible graph. And also, non-graphs cannot be expressed in this language. And let me now clarify what these uh, four constructors mean. Uh, but just uh, to mention where these ideas come from, it's, uh, it's based on a series of works that my colleagues at Newcastle University and I were, were uh, doing in, in the context of hardware design. So we had, we required a formalism for describing graphs uh, that was uh, kind of total, it didn't have this partiality, and we came up with this idea. And uh, in this work, my contribution is I simplify this, I remove the parameterized bits, I remove parameters, 
So I'm only talking about graphs. And I translate what we've done in hardware design to the functional programming con uh, context. So this is the empty graph. So this, the, constru the empty constructor creates the empty graph. There is nothing in it. We can um, sort of give it there are more usual semantics in this uh, set of vertices and set of edges. So this is empty set of vertices and empty set of edges. This is a vertex constructor. It's also very simple. So you give it an A, and it sticks us inside the graph. And you have a single vertex labeled with A, and no edges. Overlay is a bit more complicated. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll first, ex first explain the, sort of the semantics of it uh, at the level of uh, sets. So we take, the, we take two graphs, and we take the union of vertices and the union of edges. This operation uh, is quite common in graphs. It's called graph union. But I'm not calling it graph union. I'm calling it graph overlay, because typically graph union has a constraint. You're not allowed to union graphs that, are, that have shared vertices. So your, your graphs must be disjoint. I don't have this restriction. I'll allow to union or overlay any graphs, because I don't want to have any partiality in my language. And here's an example. So you have two graphs uh, with three vertices, and they have some shared vertices. And uh, you take the union, and the vertices and edges come from both of the graphs. This is, uh, if some of you did work on uh, some concurrent concurrency theory, this is reminiscent of parallel composition. You essentially, if you have two systems described by kind of, uh, graphs, you are composing them, you are composing shared events, you are synchronizing on them. And this is what Connect does. It's uh, similar to overlay. So it also takes the union of vertices, the union of edges, but also it adds another term here. It creates an edge from every vertex in the left-hand graph, in the left-hand side, of, and to, uh, to and create an edge to all vertices to the right-hand right side. So basically, like a quadratic number of edges potentially. Uh, and again, there is a uh, operation which is called graph join, which is defined exactly like this, but it's not defined for graphs with shared vertices, and I leave this restriction. I don't want to have any restrictions like this. I allow to connect graphs with shared vertices. And then, for example, in this case, we have vertex S, which is in both graphs. And this creates a self-loop. So I connect S to itself. So these are all the constructors I have. Uh, I hope they're, they're clear. And by the way, uh, I'd like to point out that I'm going to use this shorthand notation arrow to denote the connect operation. And also, on the previous slide, I had plus so plus will stand for the overlay. And they be behave like addition and multiplication uh, with numbers. So there are very, a lot of si similarities here. Uh, so coming back to our graph, uh, data type. So we have four constructors. And this is the semantics of these constructors expressed in sets of vertices and edges. And you can, uh, you know, if you look carefully at these uh, definitions, you will see that there is no way to create a non-graph. If you start with. Uh, valid sort of graphs that satisfy the consi consistency conditions, you can only be build such graphs uh, if you follow these constructors. But I would like to give uh, not only this sort of set-based semantics to this data type, I would like to give an algebraic characterization, so some, some kind of equational theory that uh, tells us which terms are, uh, that are the same, which, which expressions correspond to the same graph. So there can be multiple expressions that give you exactly the same graph. And uh, here, this is what my paper is about. Let's play with a few examples. We have uh, expression vertex 1 creates a vertex, a singleton vertex, same for vertex 2. And if you overlay these two graphs, you get two disconnected vertices 1 and 2. And if you connect them, you get two connected vertices. And we will be denoting this simply as 1 plus 2 and 1 arrow 2. Or we could use 1 multiply 2 would be uh, also possible. So these are very simple graphs. Uh, you can also connect the vertex to itself. You'll create a self-loop as at the top. And here is a more complicated example. So we overlay two sort of uh, single edge graphs. So we first connect one to two. We connect one to three, and we overlay the result. And so sort of the two graphs get kind of glued on the common vertex one. We can write it down as this formula now. And uh, when, when we look at it, we start to wonder, can we factor out one? in this expression? Sort of, can we follow the usual sort of intuition when we are working with multiplication-like and addition-like uh, values? And yes, indeed, we can. So we do have distributivity. So this graph on the left-hand side produces this expre graph expression produces this graph, and also the expression on the right produces this graph. 
So we have distributivity not only for x, y, and z data vertices, but also when they are uh, graph, uh, arbitrary graph expressions, left and right distributivity. And so this holds for our set-based semantics. But we now want to postulate that this is a law that must hold uh, for our definition of uh, these four graph constructors. We now want to uh, go away from the set-based definitions because we don't really need them. We can just define the equational theory on our expressions. So distributivity is one of the important laws. And now it starts to look very much like Semarin. And probably some of you think that this is, this is Semarin. So who thinks this is Semarin? Right? There are a couple of hands. OK. This is not a Semarin. This is almost a Semarin. But there is a slight difference. This uh, law is what make it, di make it different from Semarin's. If you kind of multiply three things, if you apply connect twice, you get this expression on the left. If you follow the rules we defined, you will get the triangle graph in the middle. But you can also get it by overlaying three edges. So they just describe one, one edge, second edge, the third ed edge, and overlay them. And they will get synchronized on the common vertices, and you will get back the same triangle graph. So I call this uh, law decomposition. Uh, I, don't ha I don't know if there is a better name. I tried to find this law in literature. I couldn't find it anywhere, which is surprising. But I think decomposition is a good name. But if you know, if you've come across this law, please let me know. So the intuition now is that any graph expression that you have can be broken down into simple primitives, into singletons and pairs, because we are working with graphs. So we can break down any expression into this sort of normal form where we have a list of vertices and a list of pairs of vertices. There will be no kind of triple or quadruple multiplications left after we apply the decomposition axiom successfully. successfully. So this is the algebraic structure. It is very similar to a semi-ring, but it's not quite a semi-ring. So our overlay, our plus is commutative and associative. Uh, our connect is associative. It's not commutative. It does matter in which order you connect graphs, because it will create edges uh, going in the opposite directions. The empty graph is the identity of connect. So if you connect any graph to an empty graph, uh, the graph doesn't change. We have distributivity, left and right, and we have decomposition law. And uh, we can, from this like minimal definition uh, of our algebraic structure, we can prove these two theorems, which are important. So overlay is idempotent. If, well, this is what's kind of obvious from the beginning. If you overlay a graph with itself, nothing changes, because it's a uh, union is idempotent. And it also has epsilon as identity. But these are kind of consequences of the above axioms. So this decomposition axiom forces our identities to be the same for two, uh, for two operations. And this is what we don't typically have in same rings. If in same rings, we have different identities. We have 0 for addition. We have 1 for multiplication. And if they coincide, you typically end up with a very trivial object, maybe with just a single inhabitant. Here we have some interesting structure. We are talking about graphs. And we have the same shared identity. OK, well, this is the mathematics uh, behind this. And there are a few additional axioms that you might want to add if you work with other sort of sorts of graphs. For example, if you're interested in undirected graphs, you can make the connect operation commutative. And indeed, for undirected graphs, A connected to B is the same as B connected to A. So if you add this additional axiom, suddenly the values uh, of these expressions correspond to undirected graphs instead of directed graphs. You can also sometimes uh, work with reflexive graphs, or graphs with, which that have self-loops. All of us, every vertex has a self-loop. And transitive graphs, or transitively closed graphs. Graphs where you always have, uh, you, where you, the semantics of a graph is its transitive closure. By adding this transitive uh, closure axiom, you basically collapse your equivalence classes even more. Uh, and now you cannot distinguish graphs that have uh, different expression, but whose uh, transitive closure coincide. And you can mix and match these axioms, and you can come up with different interesting combinations. For example, pre-orders uh, can be obtained by you know, combining reflexive and transitive axioms in addition to all the axioms from the previous slide. And if you, if you also add undirected uh, graphs, uh, this uh, commutativity of connect, you suddenly go from graphs to equivalence relations. So this is already a much simpler kind of structure. Uh, so equivalence relations can be also obtained in this axiomatic way by just adding a few extra axioms. Oops. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> coming back to Haskell now. So we have our data type. 
tree-like data type, and we know how to do various interesting things with trees in Haskell. And there are a lot of already built-in infrastructures that, that we can reuse. So we can define a bunch of instances. So this data type is, so we can compare graphs via this normal form. We can break down any expression to a list of vertices and edges and compare them. Uh, we, I also uh, like to give a num instance to graphs because then you can use mu uh, plus and multiplication to build up graph expressions, which is very convenient. And th these are kind of three very functors, applicative, monad, and monad plus. So monad plus is interesting because essentially uh, what we have uh, in addition to monad plus is just a single constructor connect because uh, empty graph corresponds to M0 from M plus. The vertex constructor is the pure from applicative or return from the monad. And the M plus from, M plus, uh, from monad plus is the overlay. So we only have uh, one additional uh, constructor compared to sort of uh, uh, what you, you would get with monad plus. So let's see how we can reuse these uh, uh, instances now. If you want to merge vertices, uh, common operation on graphs, you can just use the functor instance. Uh, you can take, uh, so this is a function that merges vertices C and D in graphs whose vertices are strings. What we do, we just map the following function, mapping function over the graph, and this, func this function tells us that C should be mapped to CD, D should be mapped to CD, and all other vertices should be left as is. And this essentially merges the two vertices, uh, and you get a graph uh, with, with two vertices merged. How do you undo this? Any ideas? How do we undo this operation? How do we split vertices? Yeah, somebody uh, said monad bind. Exactly. We, we, we can use monad now to split vertices. So this is a function that splits vertices C and D. We essentially uh, bind our graph to this function that translates vertex C D to a, a, like a graph with vertices C and D unconnected and leaves all other vertices and, and basically in, uh, kind of lifts all other vertices into singleton graphs. And now if the, after we flatten sort of this intermediate structure, we get back our original graph. So monads allow us to essentially do arbitrary substitutions of our uh, vertices, and this allows us to do uh, vertex split and also a few other interesting and useful functions. Now let's see how we can reuse monad plus. So you, you, another common operation is to compute an induced subgraph. So if you want to remove some of the vertices that are not interesting to you, uh, you can just use M filter, which is defined in the standard library. You don't need to write this function yourself. So M filter uh, is defined this way. Essentially, you go through all the vertices in your in your graph, and you check if a predicate that you pass it as a parameter holds. And if this predicate holds, you keep this vertex. You return it as a singleton graph. Otherwise, you return the empty. You substitute it with an empty subgraph, empty subexpression. And essentially, this works uh, this way. After flattening, you obtain the graph, the original graph, but with some of the vertices removed. So uh, we didn't have to write any code for this. We just use the standard function. <coughs> uh, one special case for this is remove a single vertex, which is easy to implement. But there's uh, the, 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 the trickiest function that I have implemented, which is described in the paper, is removing an edge. So this is uh, quite a puzzle to implement. So I leave it to you as a challenge. But if you are interested in the solution, read the paper. And so the, now let me just briefly explain the with class bit in the title. Uh, I don't really have time to go into a lot of details right now, but I encourage you to read the paper. But what I'm saying is that we have these uh, several uh, uh, algebras, an algebra for directed graphs, an algebra for undirected graphs, uh, and we also have multiple data types that we might, might want to use. We might want to use the uh, data type I defined, or maybe you have your own favorite data type that you like using, and perhaps it's very fast for some particular algorithm that you need to run on your graphs. So you can just make your graph data type an instance of this type class. So we can now abstract over graph representations and uh, essentially have, instead of like deep embedding of our expression language, we now have a shallow embedding of our expression language. And you can write polymorphic functions like this, which are very, very reusable. So this is a generalization of vertex constructor, vertices. You give it a list of vertices, uh, vertex labels, and it lifts every vertex into the graph and then folds them with the overlay. 
operator. So this creates a graph with a set of unconnected vertices. If you fold with connect instead of overlay, you get the click. So the click is the graph where all pairs of vertices are connected. One interesting point here uh, to, to, to note is that the size of this expression for click, click is linear in the number of uh, vertices. But the graph we construct is quadratic. So it has a quadratic number of edges. So these expressions are uh, also sort of compact representations of graphs. And uh, this is uh, something that I haven't yet explored. But I think you can probably come up with you know, faster algorithms to work with these graphs uh, than by the traditional representations where every edge is listed separately. And there is another uh, nice kind of combinator star graph is a graph that has a, like a center vertex and a lot of vertices that are connected to it. Right? So we can now define it as a combination of uh, vertex connect and this vertices kind of constructor. So we connect the central vertex to all the boundary vertices. And uh, so this has been implemented as a library. And uh, the idea is that I've defined a bunch of such functions that can be used to create graphs uh, polymorphically without committing to a particular uh, data representation. And you can uh, like split vertices, merge vertices, do a lot of stuff with them. And then one, when you're done, when you have the graph you want to run your algorithm on, you can convert it, instantiate it to a particular representation, and you can run your favorite algorithm, uh, which will be efficient in this representation, uh, which I think is... Uh, uh, allows us to get a lot more use for graph-related code. So it's available on Hackage. It's, uh, I think it's well documented and has a lot of examples, so I encourage you to have a look at the library. Uh, also, parts of the API have been formally proved in, in, in Agda. Uh, it's, uh, it turns out that this representation is also convenient for writing like, formal proofs of graph transformations and uh, verifying sort of Haskell APIs by following this uh, equational theory. And it's used in industry. So there are, I know four companies that use this library already. I'm only allowed to name, to name one of them. So the company, uh, a local company here in, here in Oxford, is Therapeutics are doing drug discovery. They are working with like biological networks and they are using this library now. And there are some others. Uh, so thank you. I, uh, uh, I have a, one question for, for the audience myself, but I'm obviously happy to answer your questions. Have you come across this decomposition law? Please let me know if, you, if you've seen it somewhere, because I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm sure somebody has come across this, but I haven't found it anywhere. And also, like plenty of uh, interesting research uh, you know, projects to work on, and I'm, I'm stuck on, on many interesting questions, and I need your help, so please help me solve them. Thank you. I know one construction. Uh, I know one algorithm. I'm still working on it. I mean, I couldn't find algorithms, obviously, suited for this particular representation, because there are none. But uh, what I currently do, I convert them to traditional representation. For example, I use containers library to find strongly connected components. So you can, s you can take this expression, you can convert it into array-based representation of graphs, and you can reuse the existing algorithms. So in this case, you will have almost no sort of uh, penalty in terms of using all these obstructions. But then, of course, you'll need to you know, reuse somebody else's code, which may be you know, more suitable for some data structures and not others. So I'm working on algorithms that work exactly on these representations, and I think they are quite exciting, and I hope to share them soon. Thank you. Uh, so I'm currently working on an, uh, one small kind of uh, part to the big picture that you are drawing, complementing the graph. So if you have a sparse graph, its representation will, will be small because you just list vertices. But what if you create, if you want to, a complement of a sparse graph? 
So it turns out that the, that the expression that you need does not increase in size very much for, uh, compared to the sparse graph. So I have a construction that, given a sparse graph, returns you an expression uh, whose size is uh, linear uh, to the size of the linear uh, representation of the uh, to, the, to the size of the sparse graph representation. So essentially, it manages to cr uh, kind of invert all the edges, and we in, uh, describe an object of quadratic size, but with linear uh, space requirements. So uh, this is one example, and I, I'm, I'm sure there are others. So basically, I, I'm trying to create like a library of this uh, to enrich this library of graph construction com uh, algorithms that allow you to keep compactness of your representations. Where are you? Ah, yeah. Thank you for the very interesting talk. And my question is also a bit of a clarification, maybe. So your data structure is very polymorphic, and from what I understand, the identity of node is actually depends on the type you use. So you can create you can create graphs in a polymorphic way, but are there any non-trivial algorithms you can actually use to analyze the into polymorphic algorithm on those graphs? And or at least that uh, if you have, for example, equality, is that enough to have interesting algorithms? Do you need more structure? Is how do you link the structure on the type A to what you can do on, from, from the graph itself? Right. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a good question. And uh, most interesting algorithms that I know require the EQ or ORT A constraint. So you need to be able to compare vertices to do something interesting. But I don't know there are some trivial algorithms that you can implement without this. For example, you can check if the graph is empty without uh, having even e EQ instance, right? So there are some simple algorithms that don't require any constraints, but most interesting algorithms do require some constraints. So this is a brief uh, comment oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that without going into it now um, and without saying it's exactly correct, uh, there may be something related to the law you're looking for, either in a notion of a fiber product Yeah, thank you. I mean, all these terms are unfamiliar to me. I, I should catch you later, and uh, yeah, I should find out how this works here. Yeah. One more question at the very back. Yes, thank you. Uh, what difficulties do you foresee in introducing any labels in the virtual label graph? Right. Uh, I don't know what's the best way to do it yet. I have a few ideas. One of them is, so if one example of an uh, edge labeled graph is a you know, finite automata, for example. On each uh, edge, you have a symbol, for example, that uh, corresponds to the action. One way you can represent such graph is as functions from symbols to graphs. Essentially, you are saying, uh, I have some of the edges of my graphs labeled with particular symbol. And uh, this is, so if given this symbol, the function returns the graph that is labeled by this symbol. So as uh, if you have a, an instance of graph, so functions that returns that return graphs are also instances of graphs, just like with numbers. So if you have numbers, then functions that return numbers can also be made uh, instances of numbers. That's what we always do with mathematics. We can add not only numbers, but also functions on numbers. So functions on graphs are also graphs, and this is one way to introduce edge labels, I think. Uh, but it's not the only one, and uh, to be honest, I don't know the right answer yet. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Thank you.